Good morning, everyone. Hey, how's everybody? <laughs> Good to see you. So thankful for the Lord's presence here today. So far, we've enjoyed um, in, in the first service uh, getting together as God's people and singing His praises, and that's what that's what our goal is. Those of you, those of us who are up here on the platform right now, our main main goal is to just lift up the name of the Lord, welcome His presence into the into our service, and so we invite you to join us in doing that. Let's worship Him together, praise Him by standing and singing this song together. This is amazing.
700 years before Jesus came to earth in the form of a baby, a prophet of the Most High God named Isaiah. Some British people say Isaiah. I like it when they say Isaiah wrote about Jesus and he said this is my servant I strengthen him this is my chosen one my delight is in him I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring justice he won't cry out or shout or make his voice heard in the streets he will not break a bruised reed. He will not put out a smoldering wick. And He will bring justice. He won't grow weak and He won't get discouraged until justice is on the earth. The islands themselves wait for His instruction. This is what God, Yahweh, says, who created the heavens and stretched them out and spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people. He says, I, Yahweh. Now, he, this is Isaiah speaking of Jesus, but Jesus is in us, okay? We are Jesus' representative on this planet. He lives in us. And Isaiah spoke this of the Messiah that was to come, but He lives in us. That Messiah lives in us. And God says, I've called you with a righteous purpose. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and appoint you to the people as a light. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. God says, I will appoint you as a light to the nations. Jesus sent out his disciples and he said, heal the blind eyes, cast out demons, people that are in prison, cast out demons in my name. Those sitting in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahweh, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. The past events have indeed happened. What he said would happen, happened. And then he says, now I declare new events, new things, new events. And I announce them to you before they occur. And we've been making declaration in this house that He's come to heal us, to set us free, to open blind eyes, to open deaf ears, to deliver people that are in, feel like they're in prison. And He said, broken reed I won't destroy and a smoldering wick I will not extinguish and this morning if you've been broken close your eyes with me if you've been broken by divorce adultery addiction if your life choices have made you feel broken he will not extinguish your life. He wants to redeem you this morning. He wants to heal you. He wants to make you whole. What's more powerful? Your choice in addiction or adultery or divorce, your choice of, of in life, of the bad decisions you've made, what's more powerful, that or what the Holy Spirit will do in your life? What's more powerful, the Holy Spirit or addiction? What's more powerful, the Holy Spirit or depression? 
What's more powerful, the Holy Spirit or anxiety? He wants to empower you this morning. I just want to ask just where you're standing if anyone says not necessarily anything I mentioned don't worry about that you could you could just say I've been hurt you could say I'm I'm battered a little I'm beat up I'm suffering I feel like a broken reed I feel like my candle is just smoking there's no flame but I just feel pain I feel some pain this morning with your eyes closed if, if anybody feels that way would you raise your hand up thank you sir yes thank you thank you thank you okay with 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 eyes open if you want someone just to Lay a hand on your shoulder and pray for you. With eyes open, if you if you need that, raise your hand again and someone will just pray over you. Anyone? Okay, in the back. In the back here, anyone else? It's right here in the front, plaid shirt. Over here. I can't see everyone all the time, so if you wave your hand a little bit. I just want anybody that, that needs prayer. And also give honor where honors do as we go to prayer John and Veralia are here teats and they've been married today right 45 years today 45 years so what I want to do is pray over them raise your hand John and Veralia right here they are thank you if you're near them just go lay a hand on them while we pray and just bless them 45 years of marriage, bless them in Jesus' name and, and pray for the people that need you, around you, as we go to the Lord. Yeah, Walt. Hallelujah. Anyone else say, I wish someone would just pray with me for a minute? Anyone? Father, you have no rival. You have no equal. There's none like you. You have all power and all authority. And then you said to us, because I have all power and authority, I want you to go in my name and lay hands on people that are broken and wounded and hurting Lay hands on them and they will recover. I believe this morning in this service, those that raised their hand and said, by faith, I need prayer, will receive healing of broken hearts, broken relationships, broken marriages, broken finances, lost, feel bound, Father, in Jesus' name, with your Holy Spirit, Lord, empower us. Empower those praying, Lord. Flow through them. Stir up Holy Spirit in those that, that stepped out to pray over others. May the Holy Spirit flow through them. Lord, the future Family Worship Center, Lord, we put in your hands this morning. Light this place, Lord. Light this place as a beacon, Father, of restoration and healing, of blessing, anointing. Saturate this building, Lord, with your presence. Saturate us with your presence. Lord, out of our innermost being, may there flow rivers of living water. Even now, Father.
just stay in this attitude of prayer. Try to sit down without changing the atmosphere. Just sit down gently if you could and don't look around. Just keep this atmosphere here as the choir comes. Isaiah 53. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed.
just great to be part of the family of God, isn't it? Bill Gaither wrote that song years ago. I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God. Been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm part of the family, the family of God. And I'm glad that we're family today. I'm sensitive to the time this morning, conscious of it, but the Lord has laid a message on my heart, I believe, will help us to, today. And it's out of the third chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 1 to 11. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms or asked for help. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew that it was he who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. It was a visible testimony of what God had done in his life. He had sat there for years begging and receiving some coins and enough money to sustain him until a couple of spirit-filled men came by to minister to him. There's a lot of ways you can go with that scripture. I was thinking as I was rereading it this week and studying and meditating, I wonder how many people had walked by that young man or that man during his lifetime and not a one of them had anything to give him to help him. I'm sure they felt sorry for him. They pitied him. They put some money in the in the cup that he held out. But they didn't have what it takes until Peter and John came by, fresh from Pentecost, fresh from the upper room experience. And Peter said, silver and gold, that's what you think you need, but we don't have that. But we have what we have we'll give to you. Jesus put it clearly to the to the twelve. It was his last final exhortation before your before Calvary. He said, I know it's I know you're sorrowful, but it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away the the comforter cannot cannot come. But when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. They were his final words after his resurrection. And then he said this, wait for the promise of the Father. The last several weeks and more, David has been speaking to us about the importance of the promise of the Father. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea and Jerusalem, Samaria, and the other parts. Of, it'll it'll stand, extend even out as far as Lansdale, Pennsylvania. The Holy Spirit move of God that started back there in the book of Acts. It, it, in John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said it clearly. I know you're sorrowful, but it is expedient. Expedient. Utterly, completely important that I go away. 
And then I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. Pentecost was that important that Jesus made it his final words. And I repeat that for that purpose. He wants us to understand the importance of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's very critical. And the promise was fulfilled. And it happened exactly like he said it would. It's a, a thrilling story. It's I grew up with that story and raised in a, a Pentecostal church. But it was thrilling. The Spirit of God fell on them. There was a supernatural manifestation. There was a sound of a rushing wind. Cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them. And then they began to speak in a language they had never learned, speaking the wonderful works of God in unknown tongues to that person. The many people that were around them, someone said, if you study this, there was at least 16 different uh, languages, 16 different countries represented, and they all heard them speaking the wonderful works of God in their own language. That, that, that was the miracle right there. They heard it in their own language. They didn't understand what they were saying because it was unknown tongues, but they heard it in their own language. And uh, the and, and subsequent uh, infillings of the Holy Spirit, as you read in the book of Acts, there was no wind, there was no uh, cloven tongues of fire, but on several occasions in the book of Acts, there was the manifestation of speaking in other tongues that the Spirit gave utterance. And it was a powerful, powerful visitation from heaven. It truly revolutionized the early church. Stay with me here. Their ministry changed from the ordinary to the extraordinary. They changed from hiding in fear. If you read it back a little bit in John, in the beginning of Acts, they were hiding in fear uh, because of the persecution and the rules that were laid down on them. The Bible says they were hiding in fear, and they went from hiding in fear to <laughs> turning their world upside down. In just a very, very brief time, they were turning their world. That's what the critics said. These people who are turning their world upside down are coming here scare them in studying this and the way I was raised in the church I realized that they were actually turning the world right side up if they would if they would uh, people would obey them but it wasn't a progressive change here on the day of Pentecost it was an immediate tr immediate transformation and the supernatural became a daily happening but I, I just want want you to know 3,000 people accepted Jesus that day 3,000 and at the next move of the Holy Spirit 5,000 you know we're happy with just one or two and we're blessed and we should be because heaven rejoices when one sinner repents can you imagine the celebration in heaven with 3,000 people Receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Peter and John were, were became buddies. Uh, they both had brothers, but somehow or other, the Lord brought them together as a team, and they worked as a team together for the Lord. And they had been enlisted by Jesus into the fishing ministry. You know, we're fishermen. Did you know that? You didn't know. Huh? We were kids, we used to sing, I will make you fishers of men. How many have heard that? Oh, if you follow me. It was a great little chorus that we used to sing. We weren't hunters. Hunters required bullets. Fishing requires bait. Is your life reflecting to other people as bait? Wow. I want what they have. They have something I need. You'll become a fisherman as well. Jesus said, I will make you 
Fisher's Amendment. There's some significant points, and I don't want to belabor them too long today because I heard somebody earlier mention make your lunch preparations. Who said that? Did you hear that? Nobody came to me and said, hey, let's go for lunch. Put that one over your head. But they, Peter and John went to church on a regular basis. They, they knew the importance of public worship. Some will say, you know, I don't have to go to church to worship God. I can worship God and golf course. <laughs> I played a lot of golf and I don't remember ever except when I made a hole in one, one time. I worshiped God. So, wow. <laughs> normally, normally, you're not thinking of worshiping God when you hit bad shots and they like, but people say that I was worshiping God when I was hunting. Well, that's possible, but it's good to go to church together. You're in the best company when you're worshiping together in his name. I believe that. They were ready to be used of God. They were ready to help. I hope when you come to public worship like this that, that you're ready to be used of God. Like we were this morning, encouraged to pray for Verily and, and, and John. You were ready to be used of God. You went over to, to minister, to be his hand extended. When we come to church, we need to be ready to help. On this day, they encountered a lame man. The Bible says that he was laid daily at the gate of the temple. Some translations say it was 38 years he was laid at the gate of the temple. Many, many believers went by him and he was never healed. But he was at the very door of the church, passed by by thousands of worshipers and never once anyone gave him what he needed. I'll make a statement that I believe is, is true right now. Within the shadow, the shadow of our churches, there are those who are lame spiritually. Many men and women, boys and girls, lost souls, poor souls, crippled by sin, being destroyed by the destroyer, and they're crying out for a cure. And there are many that are trying to help, and they want to help, and I, I praise God for people that want to help. But if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, your help is not as nearly as effective as when you come in the power of the Spirit and the, and the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit and pray for somebody that needs prayer badly. The last few weeks up here at the altar at the end of the service, there were some awesome things accomplished because people were praying in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and uh, they were helping people. But if you don't have the power to help, you need to ask for it. These, these churches that, or these, these religious groups, that surrounded Peter and James and John, they were powerless because they had tradition, traditional religion, but they didn't have the cure. The Holy Spirit is the cure. Money is not the cure. Thank God for money. We couldn't make it without money. This man had money dropped in his cup on a daily basis. Religion was not the cure. He saw enough religious people that if that helped, he would have been cured a long time ago. The Church of Jesus Christ has the answer. The world is looking for answers. In Peter and John's day and in our day, mankind is crippled, begging for someone to show them how to get well. The Church can't say, as, as, as Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. Uh, we, we're not in that situation. The church is rich and wealthy. I'm talking about the general, the church of Jesus Christ. They're well supplied. 
But they do, they're like uh, the church of Laodicea in, in Revelation. They said, we are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing bad. That's not true. We have what it takes to reach the world, but we need to use it. Get out of the lukewarmness that God said, you're lukewarm. Nothing's happening because you're lukewarm and because you're you lukewarm, I'm going to spew you, King James. I'm going to spit you out. And I think we can relate to that. If you're looking for, a, in the winter time and a cold day, for a nice hot cup of coffee, and someone gives you a cup and I can't wait, and it's lukewarm, what do you do? <laughs> Jesus said, because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You're rich, you have lots of goods, but you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and exposed. You have the name church. You meet in the sanctuary, but I'm not there. See, our dependence can't be on buildings or goods. It must be on Peter and John said to the lame man, the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk, such as I have. He knew what he had, and he exhibited the power of the Christ of Calvary, the Christ of Pentecost. I know you know that, but I just want to remind you again. There's a, Peter and John were carriers. They were, they were infected with a good, a good virus. They had the good news of Jesus and they were alive. Jesus is the answer. They said, look on us and we'll direct your attention to Jesus. Let it be when people look on us, when we're under, under the scrutiny of the lame society that we live in today, let it be that they see Jesus in us. That's my prayer, and I believe that should be our desire. Let the words that we speak be full of love and compassion and concern. Let us not be so full of religion that Christ is invisible. It's not religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that makes it happen. We, we dwell too much, I think, on the non-essentials. We need to concentrate on the essentials. Do you know that in the name of Jesus, we have authority over Satan? Yeah, we do. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can, and that works. I rebuke you, Satan. Not in my power, not because of who I am, but in the name of Jesus. And when, when you use his name, Sin's shackles are broken. Sin's stains are washed away. Peter knew that he knew that he knew that he had what it took to heal this man in the name of Jesus. They were not supposed to use that name, by, by the way. Acts chapter 4, they were beaten and, and, and ordered, don't speak again in this name, the Pharisees said. And they said, okay, okay, I'm sorry, we won't do that again. No, they went out of that room and <laughs> began to declare Jesus again. And, and they were more powerful then than they were before. The religious Pharisee commanded them, don't te teach in the name of Jesus. I want to tell you today, don't ever be ashamed of his name. Don't ever be ashamed. Speak his name. You know, it's a great testimony in a restaurant to bow your head and bless your food publicly. Yeah, it is. I mean, and I can give you examples of that, traveling as much as I've had, of opportunities to minister to waitresses or waiters because we bowed and asked God to bless the food. So don't ever be ashamed of the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.
Amen, Robert. Let's agree together. Family Worship Center. That we'll be a church that frustrates hell because of what's happening here. I want the devil to be mad. Like we used to say, the devil's mad and I'm glad. He lost a friend he thought he had. Hallelujah. I want to get him mad. We're surrounded by need. There are hooked young people at the doorstep of the church. Within the shadow, figuratively speaking, of our churches. They're hooked on Satan, on rock music, on alcohol, pornography. They're hooked to the point of being crippled. Let's give them Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter and John were filled. And they stayed filled. How did they stay filled? By faithfully attending the worship. By faithfully praying and seeking the Lord. They, they feeding the inner man that they knew needed food. They were available. They were equipped. If you read Peter's sermon in Acts chapter, I think, I think it's chapter 3. Read his sermon on the day of Pentecost. It'll bless your soul. If it doesn't, your blessers broke. I mean, it's, it will bless your soul to read his sermon and realizing he was preaching this sermon, risking persecution and punishment. So I want to challenge you today. I'm not going to take any more of your time, but I want to challenge you to give Jesus first place in your life. Give him first place. Not second place, first place. He used to sing a little chorus, Jesus and others in you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Give him first place. J is for Jesus, for he has first place. O is for others. You meet face to face, and Y is for you. Whatever you do, put yourself last and spell joy. I want to challenge you today to give Jesus first place. Like Peter and John did, they said, look on us. If people are looking on you, are they seeing Jesus? Is he a, a, are you a reflection of his perfection? When you're clobbered by the enemy, what oozes out? Is it Jesus? Or is it negative and fear? Bondage? They said, look on us. And Luke chapter 22, verse 10. For Jesus was instructing his uh, disciples for the Passover feast. They said, go find a man who will be leading a cult. Follow him. That's the point I, I want to emphasize. Find somebody that is in touch with Jesus. Get together. Be a band of brothers and sisters. And, and encourage each other. And follow those people that are following Jesus. Unashamedly. With courage and boldness. Jesus and others and you. What a wonderful way to spell joy need joy in your life today, put him first. And let the Holy Spirit direct your paths. I encourage you to do some studying on, on the Holy Spirit and the way he moves today. The last few weeks, people at this altar were receiving the Spirit and being blessed by the Holy Spirit. And that blessed me to see that happen. Because there's power in the name of Jesus and there's power in a person that surrenders to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we close the service today? And I will say this, if, if you're here this morning, and when we say the final amen, if you need prayer, we're here to pray for you. Others are here as well. Respond to your need and Pray for what you need in your life. If you came with a burden, burdens are lifted at Calvary. 
Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And He'll handle it for you. Praise God. Father, thank you for your presence today. Thank you for the encouragement we've heard from David concerning the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I pray, God, that your people will pick up on that and they'll say, I need that power. Peter and John said, we don't have money, but what we have, we give you. They knew what they had. Help us to be believers that know what we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Give us a wonderful week of serving you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful fall day today.